But in any case, let me welcome you to the third in our Development Studies Seminar Series um, of 2024. Um, and we're very excited here. In fact, we specifically and specially asked Tom uh, to come and talk to us about his new book because his book has just come out in October. And uh, it's been talked about in, in, in the politics of development circles for some months now, for some years, I would say, even. Uh, no, we've been talking about it, certainly in the Effect of States uh, crowd. We've been looking forward to this book very much. Um, and so Tom's going to talk to us. Um, it's called Ethiopia's Developmental State, Political Order and Distributive Crisis. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about Tom. Um, and then we're going to, Tom's going to talk for about, what did we say, about 45, right. yeah? And then and then Q&A afterwards, so get your questions lined up. Oh, I should say, I'm Naomi Hussain. I work in the Development Studies Department. I think some of you who've been in our seminars before have probably seen me before. Um, so Tom Lavers is a reader in politics and development at the University of Manchester's Global Development Institute. He's been researching the politics and political economy of land, industrial policy, infrastructure, and social protection in Ethiopia since 2005. His publications include two OUP edited volumes on the politics of social protection in 2020 and 2022. And they're very good because I have a chapter in one of them, so I know that. Mm -hmm. And he's got a forthcoming book, another new book coming out um, to be published by Oxford University Press entitled Dams, Power and the Politics of Ethiopia's Renaissance. Um, and that's coming out when? Summertime, hopefully. Oh, well, fingers crossed. You've been a bit busy. Yeah. Um, and uh, we'll have to get you to come back to talk about dams then, um, as well as articles in Development and Change, Journal of Agrarian Change and World Development, amongst others. So, um, Tom, are we all set technically? Is that okay? Yeah. Yeah, so Tom, up here if you prefer. Yep. Wonderful. Thanks everyone for coming and for resisting the temptation to go and see Canal Sen instead. Um, yeah, so this book basically is concerned with the circumstances under which late developing countries might achieve the challenge of structural transformation of their economies, um, and particularly whether the path of development in which in which took place in much of East, East Asia and which authoritarian regimes became, in many cases, pursued development as a means of maintaining power is still viable in contemporary, what I call late, late developing countries in this book. Um, I'm just one second. I just want to say one thing. We are actually recording this session. So if anyone doesn't want to be on record, they'd say anything that you don't want to know about. <laughs> Sorry, just had to say that. Very good. Sorry. Yeah. And in many senses, Ethiopia is quite a good case study for looking at this. Um, basically, the government that came into power in 1991, run by the Ethiopian People's a Revolutionary Democratic Front, um, <clears throat> latterly, after a period of sort of post-conflict reconstruction, war with Eritrea in the late 1990s, oversaw this period of very rapid progress from the early 2000s. So I picked out some uh, fairly random selection of, of socioeconomic indicators here. On the top left-hand corner, you've got economic growth, where basically averaging somewhere in the region of 10% a year from the early 2000s, um, and with the result, the economy trebled roughly um, uh, over that period. The top right, you've got a couple of different inf infrastructure indicators, both roads and installed capacity of electricity generation, which both of which are on a very sharp, almost exponential upward turn. Um, down on the bottom left, uh, poverty headcount, extreme poverty, and then infant mortality. And, but basically, I mean, you can pick pretty much any socioeconomic indicator and you would get a similar picture. Um, they're all showing a very sharp improvement over this period of time, which led the EPRDF government that was in power at the time to essentially label itself as a developmental state. So it's not a term I, I particularly use in the book. It's always put in these scare quotes. <laughs> where it is, it is the label that the government embraced itself and tried to frame itself as a developmental state with the result that of this rapid progress that Ethiopia came to be at a certain point in time kind of considered a model for the rest of Africa, for other late developing countries. And indeed, Ethiopia, the Ethiopian government tried to portray itself as a, as a model for other countries that they could follow. Um, 
Now, for those of you that are familiar with Ethiopia at all, you will know that that's only part of the story um, in that basically over the last decade, beginning around 2014, this all this this progress began to unravel, starting with a series of protests in Oromia region in central Ethiopia, which gradually spread across other parts of the country, ultimately forcing a change of change of power within the ruling coalition. Um, so in 2018, new prime minister from a different faction of the ruling party came to power. And that's of factional divisions and mass protests ultimately led to unraveling um, turning into civil war, which has gone from Tigray region to um, to Oromia and most recently in Amhara region of the country, and has threatened to undo much of this socio-economic progress that was achieved in that period of time. Um, so the book is sort of trying to reconcile these two somewhat divergent images of Ethiopia and trying to understand quite what was going on. Um, first of all, why a ruling party which has delivered such rapid progress was then sort of pushed out by uh, mass protests against the government and ultimately how this then collapsed into, into widespread civil unrest. And, you know, this is a topic that sort of hasn't really been addressed in a very systematic way until now. Um, the most, you know, most of the contributions that have sort of commented on this um, in popular media and, and, and some academic discussion have tended to very much place ethnicity front and center, that this is the result of ethnic divisions, ethnic favoritism within the ruling party and so on. And this is this is the root of, of a civil war, which has indeed um, manifest along ethnic lines. Now, there's undoubtedly elements of truth in that. There is, you know, ethnicity has been a central feature in the conflict and has become a, a central dividing line within Ethiopian politics. But at the same time, the argument is basically that this is, presents a somewhat limited picture of what's actually happened. And that ultimately, I would argue, distributive politics are key to understanding both the origins of Ethiopia's rapid development and also the way in which it's unraveled latterly. Um, particularly uh, both on class and generational lines, um, this uh, uh, sort of an emerging distributive crisis has contributed to this, and it's been that has in turn been filtered through ethnic ethnic division, ethnic institutions, which has led to the politicization of ethnicity in this way. So I won't talk in great detail about theory, but I'm happy to come back to it later on. Very broadly speaking, I mean the 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 book builds on the literature on state-led development, um, which has, in terms of you know literature on uh, trying to explain the politics of state-led development, has two broad themes within it. I would say, one of which associated with the likes of Atul Kohli, Peter Evans, and so on, points to the you know the structure of states and trying to understand what features of states enable um, um, governments to intervene and pursue state-led development. So they particularly point to issues of state autonomy and state capacity, um, which enable the state to intervene, particularly within with the private sector, to, to, to shape, shape the activities of the private sector and, and, and press them towards development. And to some degree that, you know, they, you know, they also then considered the origins of, of, of that state capacity and autonomy in, the, in deeper histories of state formation. Now, I'm not going to focus an awful lot on that side of it. In a long book, you have to be somewhat selective about what you present in these talks. Um, but suffice to say that Ethiopia, you know, is, a, is something of an anomaly, you know, in a literature which generally dismisses the capability of the African state um, to pursue any to to pursue um, development, Africa, um, Ethiopia has long sort of been considered a bit of an exception in comparative analyses of African states. Ethiopia is usually either explicitly included or sort of there's a footnote noting that Ethiopia is a bit of an oddity. But basically, it has a you know a, his, a long history, unlike many other places, of having a centralized hierarchical state authority. It, um, one of the few places that underwent a social revolution in Africa and which further enhanced the capacity and reach of the state and is in some ways quite well placed comparatively um, for yeah, in terms of the influence and authority of the state. What I will focus on much more is the second part of it, which is essentially trying to understand, well, why, if you have a state which has certain capacities, why do political elites actually use that capacity to promote development rather than just using it to maintain themselves in power or to enrich themselves? 
and here build on uh, the work by Richard Donor and, and his colleagues around the, who basically argue it's all down to elite threat perceptions. Essentially, when elites face mass distributive pressures, so the need to cater to the, um, to deliver for the for the for the masses for the for the popular their populations, amid severe resource constraints, which mean that it's impossible to just distribute resources from existing revenues and existing existing state resources. Um, then they have a strong incentive then to pursue development, um, essentially as a means of growing the pie um, and, and thereby creating the resources which then can be distributed to their populations. And broadly speaking, that you know that's going to often begin in, a, in an agrarian economy is likely to begin with a focus on agriculture, um, around achieve, um, distributing access to land, um, raising agri agricultural productivity through improved agricultural inputs and so on. Which, which will help to improve people's livelihoods, but ultimately is going to require a transition to manufacturing um, as a means of providing mass employment uh, for the population and delivering rising wages and economic, through economic upgrading. Um, and very broadly speaking, so in in their in their work, probably Taiwan is the clearest example of this, where they you know they basically argue that the fear of communism, tied with the very real threat of China, influenced the elite threat perceptions and pursued both initially agricultural growth and latterly manufacturing um, as a means of maintaining the, the elite maintaining themselves in power. Now, the jumping off point for this book is to build on that, but basically also to recognize that that literature tends to be quite methodologically nationalist. It focuses exclusively on the domestic political drivers of, of what's been going on, doesn't really put it in a broader global context. Um, and it's essentially a recognition that the context within which late, late developing countries um, can, in the contemporary era uh, are trying to undergo structural transformation to, and to develop their con economies is very different from early industrializers or indeed the likes of Korea or Malaysia who've already gone through some of these processes. And there's a not, there's a many different ways why, why why that context differs. But to mention a couple of the more prominent ones, one is around the global economy and that it's been the global economy has been restructured in in recent decades into global value chains, which are dominated by lead firms in already industrialized co economies, with the result that if you're currently attempting structural transformation and trying to promote domestic firms, it's very difficult for those domestic firms to enter into global value chains or and, and, um, through, and, and achieve the connections or also to develop the capabilities to be able to deliver um, in, um, in those global value chains and much less to be able to then move up the value chain into the into progressively higher and higher value, higher productivity activities, which will deliver rising wages and rising living standards. At the same time as that, you also have delayed demographic transitions. So particularly people like Tim Dyson have talked about um, how, yeah, in the contemporary era, era or in recent decades, countries have managed through technology transfer have managed to reduce fertility rates very rapid reduce mortality rates very rapidly much faster than um, they've been able to reduce mortality rates resulting in a in a much greater um, demographic increase um, rapid, much more rapid population growth than was the case in countries which underwent the demographic transition earlier so essentially what you've got is that, you know, at the same time as you've got very, very rapid population growth, uh, enhancing these mass distributive pressures, which places a lot of pressure on access to land on, and also uh, uh, subsequently on, on access to employment, the ability of governments to deliver on this um, is much more constrained than it was in the past in terms of industrial policy and, and the integration with the global economy. So essentially it raises this question that, you know, even if you end up sorting out that left-hand side side of the story there, and you have these political pressures, both state capacity and the incentives for ruling elites to pursue development as a me me means of maintaining themselves in power, it becomes increasingly uncertain whether you, whether they will actually be able to deliver the economic growth and the manufacturing growth um, that you know, was evident in East Asia and elsewhere. So, 
to move on to Ethiopia. Um, so a little bit of a history of the EPRDF. The EPRDF came to power basically through a civil war fought through the 1970s and 80s. It has its origins in the Tigrayan People's Liberation Front, um, in, which fought, in, fought initially in, in the northern region of Tigray, where um, fought fighting a Maoist insurrection. And from the very beginning, it had this kind of dual strategy for trying to, main, uh, trying to gain power. On the one hand, mass distribution was always a sort of central means of trying to gain the support of the peasantry, initially through land reform, but also some basic service delivery, education and health services and so on. At the same time as having this ethno-nationalist message trying to sort of mobilize the, pop the Tigrayan population against exploitation by the rest of Ethiopia. Um, Long story short, there was a long civil war that ultimately brought the, the TPLF to power in 1991. And as that progressed, as their ambitions moved beyond Tigray, they set up a number of other um, ethnic-based part parties to rule other parts of the country and form and to come together to form this EPRDF coalition. Um, now, there's a couple of points that are relevant there. One is essentially that right from the very beginning, the EPRDF had this kind of dual structure. On the one hand, the TPLF had fought this civil war over many, over several decades, and essentially had many of the characteristics that are often associated with revolutionary parties, so being highly ideological, coherent, disciplined, and so on. And then three much more ad hoc creations, which was essentially, were largely based on co-opting local, local leaders, um, from the other regions, um, with the TPLF being very much sort of the dominant player within this coalition. And when they came to power, essentially they had again employ employed a very similar dual strategy for trying to gain for trying to maintain power. On the one hand, it was based on ethno-nationalism, so drawing very much on Stalin's approach to the national question. They divided Ethiopia uh, up into these ethnic-based federal regions. Um, trying to draw around linguistic groups based on the idea that essentially they would, by, by giving linguistic and cultural rights, they would be able to contain a, um, ethnicity um, with, within those regions and depoliticize it, which turns out was a poor calculation. But at the same time, they also had a very clear distributive strategy. Um, so right from the very beginning, this is the prime minister, influential prime minister, Mela Zanawi, you know, drawing on their Maoist roots, they had this focus on, on gaining and, and securing the support of the peasantry. So he's you know, made the statement, let, them let the peasants never be disaffected. Once they are disaffected, it'll be the end of the world. So, um, you know, that was, the, the, that orientation was evident right from the very beginning in, in the early 1990s, but was only enhanced by a series of, uh, a series of crises which the leadership themselves termed as Armageddon's, essentially threats, existential threats to both the government and ultimately the country. So some urban protests in 2001 and then, then again in 2005 around the elections that year, a major food crisis in 2003. You can also add in a, a split in the ruling party and also the Eritrean war um, in the late 1990s. And that, those that series of crisis crises served a number of to do a number of things. One, it concentrated power around Melizanawi. So from from two thousand and one onwards, he really was sort of the the, the you know the single single most influential actor with it with, with it within um, the EPRDF and and dominated the stra direction that they were going in. And it led to this single-minded focus on development as the solution to all of their problems that you know these this avalanche of crises that was going on at that time that development would be the means to address them initially focusing on agriculture but ultimately the the imperative of industrializing and creating mass industrial employment and as he said at that time he was convinced that he'll they will cease to exist as a nation unless they grow fast and share their growth with, again, with this emphasis on very broad-based um, growth and broad-based distribution. Now, again, I, again, have, going to have to skip quite a bit, but like essentially through the 1990s, there was relatively little progress if you look initially at agriculture and um, the pressure for agricultural growth. Latterly, that began to change after, after the early 2000s, after the series of crises. 
And this is you know, the, the cereal yields for the main cereals in Ethiopia, all of which show a very sort of sharp upward trend. Um, to a large degree, this is based on sort of ext extension of the agriculture, expansion of the agriculture extension system, achieving among the, the highest rates of extension agents to, to farmers anywhere in the world. Um, also, to a degree, some expansion of the use of improved inputs like fertilizers and improved seeds and so on. Um, now, this story has already been told and, and discussed in, in much of the literature. I guess, for me, what's n noteworthy and has been missed from that is that despite achieving very rapid agricultural growth, the distributive, the distributive implications of that has largely been ignored. And this graph is an attempt to kind of capture that. So this is a rural household survey. The gray bars are the population distributed by age. And then the yellow parts are um, the population, the, the, number, the people identified as a primary user of land within that survey, which I've shortened to landholder. And you've got the red line, which is the yellow as a proportion of the gray. So what it essentially shows is that at older generations, beyond beyond your early to mid 40s, you've got uh, that when the survey was taken, you have got a pretty reasonable chance of gaining access, of having access to land and agricultural livelihood. That falls off precipitously below your early 40s. And essentially the reason for that was that under the previous government, under the Dirk military government in the 1980s, they had they had take, undertaken the original land reform in 1975, had, had, but continued to redistribute land periodically um, to take into account changing household structures and so on. Um, so there'd been relatively regular redistributions. When the EPRDF came into power, they initially prevaricated about this, weren't, were unsure what to do. Ultimately, around the end of the 1990s, beginning of the 2000s, they put in place a series of reforms which basically prevented any future land redistributions. Essentially, their concern was that in the context of rapidly growing population, that you, you would end, you, if you carry on redistributing, you're going to end up with smaller and smaller and smaller plots of land, which ultimately are going to become economically unviable. And they were persuaded to stop, uh, yeah, basically put in place measures which prevented any future land redistribution. Now, what that did, obviously, is that, you know, for, for young adults reaching adulthood after, um, sort of, say, the late, late 1980s, it means that you have almost no no mechanism of achieving a, a, an agricultural livelihood. You can you, know, you can wait around and hope that your parents die, and then and you inherit land. Um, and there are very very limited reallocations of bits of commonly commonly held land within within rural villages. But you know, large scale land redistribution was no longer an access to a means of accessing a rural livelihood. And the grey bar shows that obviously, yeah, that, yeah, so the black line is essentially an, a rough approximation. It varied um, in different parts of the country, but a rough approximation of when the last land redistribution would have been. So, yeah, it obviously falls off very rapidly after, um, below, that, below that age. So it essentially means that an entire chunk of people, of young adults in the, you know, in the 20s, 30s, are denied access to a rural livelihood plus a, a, a very large body of, of people who haven't yet reached adulthood have you know, a, a, you know become increasingly aware that there is no chance that agriculture will ever provide them with a livelihood um given given the size of the of the rural population and the and the young age of it um which all means that in terms of an agri you know essentially that agricultural growth is all accruing to people on the right-hand side of that graph and, and, ex and largely excluding people on the left-hand side, which means that the imperative of industrialization is, is even more acute. And you know, the government recognized this um, from the early 2000s, it put in place its first industri serious industrial strategy where they selected a handful of um, economic sectors, which they were gonna focus off on in terms of manufacturing. Um, Again, you know, their approach initially was very much based on this, on on you know, their interpretation of Taiwan and Korea, the idea that you could protect the domestic markets, try and build up domestic capitalists um, through 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 um, trade protections, gradually nurture them, provide them with the right incentives, so that ultimately they will be able to move into exports and become globally competitive. Um, 
One of those was the textiles and apparel sector. So the gray bars are um, the exports with the gray, the, the gray dots are the targets that the government set for exports. Yellow is employment and then employment targets in the diamonds. And initially, yeah, this, this sort of initial phase up to around 2012 was very much focused on domestic capital, um, trying to build up domestic firms, setting up joint ventures with, with, with foreign investors in many cases to try and transfer technology. The reality was that, yeah, this was didn't didn't succeed, um, that they were, they, the domestic firms just didn't have the, cap the capabilities to be able to enter into, into global value chains. They struggled to secure, secure contracts. In the first place, when they did get contracts, they struggled with the you know demanding flexibility and cost requirements that um, global investors, um, the global lead firms required. And ultimately, yeah, clearly they felt they fell well short of the very ambitious government targets that were set. And around 2013, there was a shift in strategy where the government, instead of pursuing domestic capital, realized that this wasn't going very well and, and changed the approach. So, so from that point onwards, the sort of central feature was in building industrial parks built by the Chinese, but state owned industrial parks. Um, which were the intention is then to persuade existing global value chains, global lead firms to re to move parts of their production to Ethiopia into these industrial parks as a means of accelerating industrial in, industrial growth. Now, again, there's been a bit. There was a bit of an act to uptake. There were certainly some major successes in that strategy in terms of persuading some major major textile firms to to relocate production to Ethiopia, and that got celebrated. In, and you know, justifiably in many cases. Yet in terms of the overall picture, in, ter in terms of the government's ambitions for the sector, in terms of both exports and employment, clearly it was still, you know, didn't have to have the chance to play out and, and, and did not you know, meet, meet the government's expectations in that sense. Um, you have a very similar picture in terms of leather and leather products. Um, so here you've got a bit more detail in terms of the bars, in terms of what is being exported. So essentially you have a shift from the grey and the yellow on the left hand side, which are raw and semi-finished, um, yeah, raw, raw leather essentially. Um, and then on the right hand side, some, some upgrading towards exporting semi-finished leather and leather products. Um, and yeah, essentially, as a result of government export bans, where they where they prevented domestic firms from exporting um, raw raw materials in in attempt to sort of promote more greater process processing internally. Um, but again, similar pattern of initially focusing on focusing on domestic firms, which failed to really really capitalize on the on on the incentives that the government were were were, were giving them. And from the 2012, 13 onwards, a turn towards industrial parks um, as, and, and trying to persuade foreign investors to relocate. So again, you had some notable successes, some Chinese shoe producers relocating to Ethiopia and, and try and set up production there, um, which, which did, yeah, noteworthy successes to it in a certain sense, but again, far short of government expectations in terms of what this was going to deliver. Um, and then the last sector I'll look at is the sugar industry. So in this case, it was you know very much state investment um, uh, in in the in the sugar sector. So state-owned um, enterprises. There was talk at points around getting foreign investors, but there doesn't seem to have been much demand. So the state decided to pursue this itself. Invested vast amounts of money in a whole series across the country of sugar plantations and sugar factories. And yeah, of all the sectors, this is probably the biggest disaster of the lot. Um, so you've got the grey bars basically showing pretty much flat production in terms of sugar, um, nowhere near the massive expectations in terms of government export targets. So the idea was that they would be able to eliminate sugar imports um, and that sugar, the sugar sector would become a major source of foreign exchange earnings as a result of, of, of large scale exports. And this completely failed. You, the yellow line is um, sugar imports. So, in the context of growing demand, you know, yeah, sugar the sugar has still become a has become a major drain on foreign exchange um, to, to to finance imports. Um, And that, in terms of the employment shares, the result has been that there's been relatively little change. So you've got the blue bar, which is agricultural employment, which has fallen to a certain degree. 
to the extent that it has fallen, that's mainly been absorbed by the service sector. Apparently, this is actually an over overestimate of, of, of the change within the agricultural sector in that a lot of that change has actually been a reclassification of domestic workers in rural households have been mo essentially moved from agriculture to services. So it's kind of a, something of an overestimate of how much, you, much change you've had in terms of employment shares. But perhaps the key is the industry, at the, the yellow one at the bottom, there aren't available data to separate out manufacturing employment. But yeah, industrial employment is relatively flat. If you if you were able to separate ma out manufacturing, you I think you'd find it would be a relatively small share of that. In that a lot of industry and industrial employment is actually in the construction sector and other things. So this big push around manufacturing has actually translated into very little in terms of absolute terms of yeah the 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 share of employment. Um. And this has then translated into just as you've had this sort of generational division and access to rural land and rural livelihoods, you also have this generational division in terms of urban unemployment. Um, so you've got the black line there is the total employment, yellow is the total youth employment, much higher. Um, and then also, yeah, a gender division where, where women tend to be much, uh, much more likely to be unemployed than men. Um, now, what this shows is essentially a drop in um, unemployment initially and then stagnation from that point onwards. Again, I think this is slightly misleading in terms of what the picture up to 2005. Essentially, a lot of that drop in unemployment would be so the government invested enormous amounts of money in micro and small enterprise schemes, providing credit to groups of young people to do very basic, low productivity, low wage activities, things like building, building roads and breaking up stones to yeah, build cobblestone roads, um, very small scale, scale trade activities and so on. So, you know, in terms of reducing unemployment rates, it was clearly had some success, but in terms of actually delivering meaningful livelihoods which with, with, with opp future opportunities and, you yeah, know, with, with potential for ra rising productivity, much more limited. And then from 2005 onwards, Large, basically stagnation um, in the unemployment rates. But again, in the context of ra a very rapidly growing population and a you know an urbanizing population, so ra particularly rapid rapid growth in urban in urban population, that's translated into an actual significant increase in the number of people who are unemployed in urban areas. So more than doubling over the period from two thousand and five onwards, both in terms of total unemployment and total youth unemployment. So, yeah, I mean, as I said earlier, the you know this this government strategy was very much based on distribution, trying to generate the distributive resources with which to keep people, people yeah, maintain political order, maintain political stability. But it was never just an assumption that you distribute resources and hope for the best and hope people go quiet. It was always a what's I mean, there's a book called by Michael Albertus and colleagues called Coercive Distribution, where they talk about this strategy of enmeshment where essentially regime, authoritarian regimes distribute broadly as a means of tying people to the regime. And it was very much this strategy in Ethiopia where it was distributing resources through party state structures um, in order to tie large sections of the population to the regime and yeah, limit social unrest. An enormous amount of effort was went into building local party state structures. So in theory, the Kabele is the lowest level of, of, of the Ethiopian state. Um, but beneath that, this whole sort of assemblage of structures were put in place to organize and mobilize people. So yeah, each, yeah, every every five households came together to form a what, what's called what was called a one to five group, with which had you know five households and one leader, again divided in terms of male, female, and youth one to fives. The leaders of those one to fives then came together to form the development teams. Now, in theory, these had a developmental purposes and they were used for developmental purposes as well. So ma the male team is predominantly in agriculture, female team is predominantly around health. But they were also fused with party political structures. So you had a whole system of party cells where the leadership of these different groups were, were tended to overlap with one another. And yeah, from the perspective of a household, you know, were pretty much interchangeable. 
Um, and pretty much every resource as a household that you, every resource you could, you, you required, particularly in rural areas, but also to a degree in urban areas was filtered through these party state structures. So to, still to this day, all land is state owned in Ethiopia. Um, agricultural inputs came through state affiliate, affiliated cooperatives. Um, extension services came from the state development agents, which tend to work, tended to work with the, with the male, men, male development teams. Um, microcredit came from party affiliated microfinance institutions. So even food aid and social protection would be like allocated based on selection by, by these different units. So distributed down from the Kaveli level with quotas and lists put together by these teams. So obviously, you know, this makes it incredibly difficult if you're if you're a rural household and every aspect of your livelihood that you rely on comes one way or another through the party state, you're going to have strong disincentives to be yeah, to question, question the government and, and resist them. The key challenge, of course, comes with the youth um, one to fives in that when in a kind of context where both the rural land land tenure regime and the urban employment um, access um, is both has this generational division we talked about in previous slides. Essentially, the youth development teams never worked very well. They were ne always dysfunctional, primarily because the state had very little to offer them. Engaging within these within these structures had li very little material payoff to it. And so, you know, there might have been some token support, but yeah, the youth development teams were never anywhere near as um, influential as the male development teams, and to some degree also the female ones. So essentially, you had a this sort of generational escape from the, from this you know, strategy of enmeshment um, by the ruling party. Now, even a yeah, a, a distributed crisis only becomes a political crisis when you have a spark that sets it off. Um, and that in in Ethiopia's case, it was um, the plans for the expansion of Addis Ababa, which were the sort of the key spark that ignited all of this. So this map basically shows the expansion of Addis Ababa over time. So you've got the dark, the black parts, are the sort of old historical parts of Addis Ababa, the lighter gray you get is the more recent expansion. So in the context of the ethnic federal system, when it, when it was set up in the 1990s, Addis Ababa was set up as a separate administrative unit, entirely surrounded by Oromia, but distinct from it. Um, but with... And, and that's the dotted line is the administrative uh, administrative area that was allocated to Addis Ababa at that time. By you get to the, by the time you get to the mid mid two thousands, Addis has basically grown to the point where it's exceeded the boundaries and used up pretty much all of the land within Addis Ababa, and has big has began to sprawl out along the, the main roads in and out of the city. Um, and the government, in its top down way. Um, it, decided to launch this urban planning project called the Addis Ababa, well, popularly became known as the Addis Ababa Master Plan. And that's what the colored parts on that are. So yellow is planned housing expansion out into, into Oromia in the surrounding surrounding region. Purple is the in planned industrial expansion. So both new inv industrial investments, but also relocating sections of industry from the inner city out to the periphery. With yeah, red the red line is the is the light railway plans for exp um, expansion of the transport network to be able to bring people in from these housing developments outside. Now the original decision to create Addis Ababa as a separate administrative entity was itself con controversial. Had long been a sort of a flashpoint for Oromo nationalists. The decision to then yeah, essentially what they the, you know this this urban technical urban planning approach. Which they employ to try and try and manage this process, which had, yeah, what was already happening in terms of uh, uh, un, uh, um, an unplanned process of expansion to try and manage that and regulate that was widely interpreted in Aramea as being essentially a land grab of uh, Aroma land. So essentially, you for historical reasons, Addis Ababa has always been sort of a multi-ethnic, predominantly Amharic-speaking city. The rural countryside around is predominantly Aromo farmers speaking Afan Aromo. So essentially what this plan involves is the displacement of Aromo farmers by the multi-ethnic city. And that yeah, was cast very rapidly as you know, a, 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 yeah, expropriation of, of, of the Aromo, of Aromo land and, and the loss of Aromo land to the multi-ethnic city and the exploitation of the EPRDF. 
and often tied in with a land with a you know a, a land tenure regime which yeah land could be given that it was land was state owned um land was could be expropriated with very minimal compensation um essentially mean that meaning that farmers were, off, were very often left destitute by expropriated land um it attracted all kind all manner of corruption because yeah essentially you're taking land from a rural tenure system where land can't be bought and sold and informally is valueless into an urban system where the there was an urban leasehold system where la land could be bought and sold um, and had enormously high value. So that creation of rents inevitably attracted corruption as well. So within that whole mix overlaid with ethnic divisions, you've got a particularly explosive um, situation. And essentially this, yeah, these maps show the spread of the protests. So beginning in 2014, very much focused on Western Aramea and very much focused on the master plan and the plan uh, and all the rumors about the master plan, particularly initially went quiet as a result of mass government suppression. Um, and, but then exploded again in 2015 into 2016 across Aramea initially, then into Amhara region and to a certain degree to other parts of the country as well. Now, alongside this, you have um, yeah major changes in the elite politics as well. The, the key factor being the death of Mela Zanawi in 2012. So he had you know managed to centralize power in the early 2000s. When he passed away in 2012, that sort of reopened a whole set of grievances. Um, and essentially, these protests came about in, from 2014 onwards. And I would say magnified the divisions that, that were beginning to exist within the ruling coalition. So different parties within, within the ruling coalition viewed these protests in very different ways. And the, for the TPLF, this was seen as a major existential threat and a threat to, the threat to their hold on power. For the Oromo and latterly the Amhara parts of the ruling party, this was, you know, these protests were seen as a tool for political, that could provide political leverage with the TPLF to you know, resist what, uh, what had always been a somewhat subordinate status within the ruling coalition. And so you started to see political leaders, in some cases, explicitly aligning themselves with the protesters, but undoubtedly also sort of informally encouraging them at points in time. Um, this is a statement by the Oromia president, Lema Magersa, who's there with what's now the prime minister, Abiy Ahmed, his one-time ally. Where he said, yeah, why persist with costly street protests when we've made your demands our own? If we fail to deliver, I'll, I'll be back on the streets with you. So a very it's clear attempt to align himself with the protests and capture this movement. And ultimately, you had yeah, an alliance between the Oromo and the Amhara branches of the ruling party was sufficient to force this regime, regime change, which eventually came about in 2018. Um. So in terms of just wrapping up, I'm probably out of time, I suspect. Um, in terms of thinking through what the legacy of this developmental state era is. So on the one hand, there has been, there was significant progress, economic growth, socioeconomic indicators, infrastructure, and so on. But ultimately there's this legacy of a generational distributive crisis where, yeah, a whole generation of young adults lack agricultural um, urban employment opportunities. Particularly problematic, I mean, that in itself is not necessarily unusual within Africa, but particularly problematic is the, the way that this has then been framed, that while it, you could, you know, frame, the, frame this distributive crisis in generational or indeed class terms in terms of you know, capitalistic um, expropriating rural landholders, it's been framed almost exclusively in ethnic terms as a result of the nature of the Ethiopian political system and the, the incentives provided by ethnic federalism. At the same time as you've also had elite fragmentation along ethnic lines, with the result that, yeah, rather than just an elite level conflict uh, over competition for power, that has then become embroiled in a much more societal level conflict, into, uh, which, is, which is forged along ethnic lines. Um, which has led to, you know, the catastrophic um, civil war and conflict that's been raging over recent years. That then, in turn, I mean, broadening out back to where I started a little bit, I mean, that has important implications for 
late, late development much more broadly um, in the sense that, you know, the EPRDF, I think most people would would argue that, yeah, in many sense, the Ethiopian state is relatively well placed amongst late, late developing countries uh, in terms of having the authority and capacity to be able to deliver on, on, on um, state led development. Far from perfect, but relatively well placed. You had for a period of time an elite which was focused very clearly on delivering rapid development, yet ultimately was unable to, to, to achieve it. So it raises questions which many other people have asked about, you know, the feasibility of replicating anything like East Asia economically, but also politically, like in terms of the political um, incentives that drove East Asian developmentalism and whether that sort of, yeah, it is a viable strategy for contemporary authoritarian regimes to pursue development as a means of maintaining power. That certainly is not the calculation that I would say most authoritarian, contemporary authoritarian regimes have, have made. On the whole, they're mu much more focused on manipulating elections, some degree of coercion, and some degree of patronage. So, yeah, I think you know Ethiopia as one example where a regime did try and pursue that approach of yeah development as its meet as route to power. I think it raises questions about how viable that is going forward. Um. I'm going to stop there with just one, as Naomi mentioned, there is another book on its way on that Ethiopia's dam building. That's the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam. So it's basically a political history of dam building through from Haile Selassie through Meles to Abiy Ahmed, taking in Salini, which is the Italian firm which has been building most of Ethiopia's dams. Obviously relations with, with Egypt and also Metek, uh, the military engineering firm which we got embroiled within Ethiopia's dam building to catastrophic consequences. And I will leave you with that, which, so the book is, I'm not here to sell the books. It's, it's open access. So if you follow that link in theory, that will take you to a copy you can download. Hey. Thank you, Tom. Oh, I mean, you know, it's really fascinating, but it's also really a bit depressing. It's very depressing. I mean, you're left with this feeling that, you know, if, if Ethiopia couldn't do it, as you say, the, the strength of the state capacity and so on, where could? Um, and so I, I, you know, I'm not going to, yeah, sure, I, I got you. I got you just a second. I'm not going to use up my, you know, chair privileges. Just want to make sure, you know, you're, you're going to monitor if there are questions coming online that. Does it need to be done here? It's there, okay. So do you want, should we sit down here and take the questions over there? Is that a good yeah. plan? Yeah. And then you can monitor the questions from there. Um, and we're going to take um, a few questions at a time. Is that on now? Yeah. Can you hear? Yeah. Yeah. We're going to get, so we're going to take three at a time. Um, Chris, I think you, you look very urgently like you really need to ask a question. So one, two, and a third one, if there is another one. Let's start with you, Chris. Thank you. Oh, wait, we need to give you the microphone, though, so that you can be heard. Yes, thank you. No, let's use the microphone. Not far as Zoom. <laughs> Zoom cannot hear you from there. <laughs> thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. Tom, that was lovely. Really, really neatly done. And and even though I have read a fair bit of this and heard you talk before, really interesting. And, and thanks. Um, and please send me an advanced copy of the damned book. I'm very, very <laughs> but I thought I might just raise a few points, if I may. Some of them probably naive, some of them a little bit devil's advocate or angel's advocate, I don't know which it is, um, to counter what, what uh, Naomi picked up on the end, uh, at the end, which was that it's very depressing, and Ethiopia is a bit depressing right, right, right now. But I wonder if there's a, a risk of falling into what in the Latin American context is called fracasomania, the kind of obsession with failure and weakness. Um, everything kind of seems to be, oh, they didn't reach the targets and this mm. and that. And, um, you know, you kind of put it in the global context at the beginning, began to sound a bit like the sort of Danny Roderick impossibilism story. Um, well, everybody else industrialized, but Africa can't do this and so on. The world's too nasty. And at the end, 
Ethiopia just seems to suggest that nobody else can do it either. So um, I, I, I kind of, I'm not 100% sure about this. Um, firstly, I think that uh, one has to think about, well, what's the appropriate benchmark? Is there a world in which capitalist development is really nice and smooth and 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 nice and and easy and linear and so on, and and more specifically in terms of benchmarks, should we be taking government targets really as the measure of what's happening, mm -hmm. or seeing that in some of those things the slope was upward, you know things were changing in quite interesting ways, but over a very very short period of time, and structural change typically takes rather a long time. Um, so so I, I kind of, you know, that, that was a question. And that question, in a way, at its most extreme, uh, would lead to um, possibly an, uh, another uh, argument, which is, is it, what did you quote Mellis saying? Um, that the country will cease to exist unless we grow fast and share. Maybe he was really wrong about that. And the reason it ceased to exist is because it grew and it shared. Because there really was a real expansion in Ethiopia, there really was, and I mean, we can come back later and discuss the data. I think, you know, as you said, you can pick any indicator. You can also pick any indicator in Ethiopia and question it. That's a, another problem mm. we all have with all our stories about Ethiopia. But, but, is there a possibility that it was rapid growth and that much of that change was shared, but unevenly shared? Education spread. There was agricultural change, the universities put here, there, and everywhere and stuff that that um led to not so not only the demographic tension, but also very, very rapidly changing class dynamics, rising inequality, uh, and that some of the dynamics of protest in a context of the his history, the national history, and so on, um, had more to do with with that rather than abject failure across the board. Um, I don't want to go on, so I'm going to try and try and be very, very quick. The second thing is um, you've got this model whereby, which I love and I agree with a lot of it and know the literature, you know, the, there's there's a threat. And the only way to survive in the context of a threat is to do development. But one thing I want to give a bit more life to is the fact that the response to the threats wasn't inevitable and that we need to give a lot of attention to ideas. And those ideas were really contested within Ethiopia, within the EPRDF, within even the TPLF, and between the leadership and its friends. They were very careful to talk about their friends, sorry, at the World Bank, and, and even worse, the IMF, and the DFID, and the Brits, and so on, other Brits, and so on and so forth. There's, you know, there were real tensions of, over policy and ideas, and I think that's kind of a rather exciting part of the, of the history. Mm. Um, briefly on, on land, you told another depressing story about land, which was actually very interesting and great slides, but seems to be no scope for changing dynamics and the possibility of wage employment and class differentiation there as partly a driver of conflict, but also a driver of livelihoods, apart from having a tiny little plot of land. If we're going to talk failures, I wonder whether there's another one that you didn't talk about, and it's food price inflation, mm. which I think was really, really serious part of this story. And I could go on. I want to, and um, I, I won't. Yeah. Thank you. You'll get another chance after. Mm. That was quite a lot of questions. So I don't know if you want to, or points, do you want to take those first? And or, Okay, let's go to you. Yes. And yeah. do introduce yourself, please. Yeah, my name is Oh Jung Jin from Korea, and I'm studying in development. I'm so glad that at least you talk about something success, because during I'm studying and many people just say that we are imposed by the Western powers. We cannot do anything. So I want to have one at least to uh, hope. And then I know that uh, they reduced this uh, poverty from 69 to 27 within like 20 years. So the, I have a very short three questions. First of all, uh, Ethiopia is a very interesting country with a role of government. But I want to know what makes difference between Mengitus and El Melas Janawi to now a current government. They must have failed many things and how they continue overcoming. Like, uh, I, I know some of, of my case in Korea and uh, Taiwan, but second is like, um, may, maybe they can be, you can say like elites and human resources. Second can be the, um, 
the the like um, how they deal with the debts, like uh, you know Chinese uh, capitals and you know the many countries like K Kenya and they they lost their ownership of the rails. But how do they pay back the debt and still financing? Like like uh, I know that Ethiopian saving amount is not that great. Third, like how what can be the strategy for the future? not to stay in just production base or outsourcing country, like a case of Bangladesh, then uh, what's the strategy to leap to the next level so that uh, still growing? And some good questions. No. So I, I also have one, so this is the third from this round or the ninth from this round, I think it might be, <laughs> which is, you know, we talk about the, you know, the, the authoritarian developmental state. And I'm old enough to remember when there was a moment of hope, maybe pre-2005, when, you know, it was, you know, we it, we, it wasn't necessarily going to be authoritarian. Yeah. What, what What is the, you know. system what is the you know why why do we think it's inevitable that this authoritarian rule is here permanently what is the what is the you know what's changing here from what you see so let's uh go with these in whichever order you prefer yeah there's a lot there <laughs> um so i guess the last one's perhaps the easiest one to answer i mean i think Currently, our prospects for democratization in Ethiopia, I think, are pretty limited. Um, the current government is entrenched in intent on entrenching itself on in power on pretty much to any cost going. Um, and yeah, elections happen, but I'm not sure they mean an awful lot. Um, I think it, it, the argument wasn't. I think, I mean, looking back, if you look back at the post World War II era. The countries that have achieved structural transformation, have transformed, have almost without exception been authoritarian, the big successes. Now, I, it's a debate I try and sideline rather than getting too, too, too stuck into it about whether democracy is viable as a, uh, 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 compatible with structural transformation development. I mean, I think there are certain reasons why the right authoritarian rulers with the right incentives may have it slightly easier, but it's not a particular debate I wanted to get into. Um, I think the prospects in Ethiopia are somewhat limited at the moment, but yeah, things change. Um, we'll see. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't... It, in, in terms of presentation like this, it's always a challenge. Even in a book, it's, it's, it's a challenge to find the right balance and fit everything in. Certainly in 45 minutes, it's it's a challenge. So the government targets, they're put there as uh, as a device to sort of like show what, to show where this fits with it, with it with respect to government responsibilities. And I think there's, it's important to think through, well, what what would constitute progress in Ethiopia versus what the political incentives were and the political ambitions of the ruling elite were. And those two aren't necessarily the same thing. So there was progress, undoubtedly. It was nowhere near any of their targets and nowhere near what they felt. You know, their, as I, you know, my argument was that, you know, their strategy for maintaining power was based on structural transformation and mass employment creation. So some upward tick, and I tried to emphasize this, that there were, there were positive developments along the way does not meet their political ambitions of how they think they're going to keep, yeah, you know, tie people to the regime and keep keep people quiet. So I think that distinction is important. That even yeah, progress progress. What we what I I would consider progress. And I think most people would consider progress, and there was very real progress. Didn't translate into meeting sometimes fantastical ambitions in terms of what the targets were, but the sort of the, their view about how you how this massive social upheaval and i totally agree with you that yeah development isn't smooth um this social upheaval could be managed and controlled um however naive that that possibly was um so in terms of, yeah I'm, I'm, in terms of wage employment differentiation i mean i think so there has been a certain amount of 
particularly domestic investment investment also some degree sort of horticultural floriculture where you have had differentiation which yeah is not represented there it's in the book um I and mean, i think the big challenge is that that remains a quite a marginal sector of the ethiopian economy and and in certainly in terms of numbers of people involved the mass the by far the majority of in terms of the population remains smallholder agriculture mm. and within that the land tenure system just doesn't allow for differentiation there are so such extreme risk constraints on buying and selling land and even renting land that there is yeah your your ability as an ethiopian farmer to accumulate i think is quite limited um in terms of the next set of questions difference between mangusta and mullahs um thanks to mullahs and now Okay. Yeah, oh, so yeah, we put the government to plan then, and it, it was a big failure. Even there was a famine, many people died because of the hunger. Now the government seems functioning. So what makes the difference? The government seems functioning now. I mean, the, yeah, like uh, it's a strong government, but uh, like government land, before the government plan was totally wrong. They yeah. this uh, agri the farmers from north to south, and then that yeah. it was a big failure. But there now, is a famine going on now, though. Yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah. The, the, like, it's, it's so, hard, but uh, still, it's better than before, right? Mm. What I would say government... currently this government is focused on nothing but maintaining power in the coming weeks, coming months. I wouldn't have said it. I said it's completely dysfunctional. Like there is an inattention to industrial policy, agriculture, anything other than maintaining power and who they're fighting currently to keep the yeah to try and prevent themselves from losing power. So I wouldn't describe the current situation as remotely functional. I think there was an important difference between the Mangustu and the sort of Mellas era in that well one was ideological yeah. so yeah state own state state ownership control command economy versus at least some degree of an embrace of a capitalist economy okay. um uh yeah and and I you know and and I think yeah Mangistu didn't lack this idea that development was going to be the central focus of what he was doing again he were he fought you know his entire time in office was fighting a whole range of different competing revolutionary groups there was never a moment of stability like yeah resources were continually being funneled into the military to fight and maintain power and there was a brief period where that wasn't the case and the ethiopian government was able to yeah I mean, they funded the military undoubtedly but not to the ex same extent and were able to focus on other things as well so you can defeat uh, those are different kind of authoritarian right yeah um how they're going to pay back the debt, I think, is a question that no one knows. <laughs> I think the Chinese have pretty much given up on the idea that they're going to pay back most of those debts. Um, but yeah, the debt crisis has become a major, major issue. I mean, part of this, I mean, my my sense would be that as this process was gradually unraveling, and this is probably more, more, more from the second book rather than the first one, the politicians became increasingly ambitious about the scale of infrastructural um, projects that they were pursuing in the hope that yeah mega projects would outpace the sort of the crisis that was brewing and as a result of that it well not only they first of all they bypass technical capacity what capacity there was it became politically driven infrastructure projects rather than anything involving real you know insight into what you know efficiency and so on but also, yeah, accumulated massive, massive state debts, which mm. I suspect probably won't be won't won't be payable, um, including dams. So, who's financing that big dam? The one, you, the one in the book. Uh, good question. Um, in theory, it's fun, it's it's funded by Ethiopia, um, and to a to a degree, it certainly is. I think it's a lot of commercial loans essentially underwriting it, which have. Yeah. Expensive loans. Getting increasingly expensive, yeah. Um gosh. Gosh. Okay. Uh yes. So speaking of the dam. Would you like to introduce yourself so we know who you are? Oh, and also the microphone, sorry. <laughs> I'll get used to this. It's Hi everyone. I'm Salam, I'm a student here at SOAS, and my question was, um, what do you see for a future of the GERD? Do we see a future of us actually transitioning to making money into 
Ethiopia and also the rest of supplying electricity for Africa. That was, I think, one of the biggest goals, um, a future of seeing actual economic change in other African countries and refocusing and focusing on ourselves as Africa as a whole. And then also for the future of Ethiopia's government, what does a transition into um, new leadership look like? You talked about us always putting ethnicity at the forefront and why a lot of the parties are not trusting each other and even how all of these protests have been um, happening and influencing everyone's feelings towards leadership. So what does a transition into new leadership look like? Great, thank you. And there's, so the person in front of you, Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Tomas. I study development studies. Um, I have a somewhat sort of long-winded question that probably doesn't have an answer, but... Um, Just go this, for it, yeah. Give <laughs> us your thoughts on a potential future government, which, you know, there is no signs of someone coming in in the near future, but um, how they may potentially use developmental state slash industrial policy to bring about some form of ethnic cohesion, national cohesion. Um, like if a Kagame Rwanda kind of approach to the country would rest some of the conflict mm -hmm. to build some somewhat of a national identity and potentially provide a point for the economy to regain some of that growth and the uh, command thank you Tom um I think we've, we've discussed these things before just a couple of reflections going back to, to Chris's point I think one of the main uh question marks is is the timing of of all these different crises mm -hmm. uh when you when you take some of your yeah, analytical categories of distributed pressures, um, you know, some of basic structural conditions that you refer to, one could argue that they were all present in the 1990s. Arguably in the 1990s, uh, the fragility of the system was also there as it was just, you know, being born. And towards the end of, of, of that decade, you know, you have a vicious war with Eritrea. Um, so really the question remains and why now? Well, why the crisis now been after 2018 or 2020 and not then? Uh, what what's really the trigger? And I think you know Chris has, has a point that it is precisely the sort of dynamism and rapid change and and also the the visibility of development yeah. for most people. I mean, not least in terms of the construction boom, mm. infrastructure construction uh, that has been unprecedented by um, uh, historical by African standards, and certainly also by Ethiopian standards, uh, was was an important trigger. Uh, and, and one thing that we did find, I mean, we were doing research at that time in 2016, 17, 18, in those industrial parks and employment and the construction sector and so on. And I think at that time there was there was class politics going on at the workplace. Um, and despite the, the you know, ethnic uh, framing of, of a lot of the battles, and in fact, a lot of the uh, labor conflict, which we observed and we, we which we've written about, and, and particularly in factories, where um, real labor conflicts, uh, um, real examples of collective action around labor grievances, precisely because of the mismatch between the expectations generated by these very rapid development and change and the realities that a lot of people were finding when they were getting those jobs in the first in the first place. So I think that is something that needs to be answered and there. And then there's the question of the opportunism of uh, those who were in this in this coalition to take advantage of some of these uh, um, 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 different types of conflict to politicize them and to give them an ethnic framing, which then at some point gets out of control. Mm -hmm. So I think understanding that timing is fundamental. But I think when we were doing that research, to be honest, I think everyone uh, uh, would say, well, this is a ticking bomb. But it's always difficult to say, well, when is that going to explode? Is yeah. it tomorrow in five years' time or 10 years' time? Mm -hmm. But everyone was aware of the fragility of that political settlement. And that fragility was not was there then, but also was there in the 1990s. And those pressures that you've been talking about were also there in the 1990s. But it's really that 
sort of dynamism, the inequality, the, the inflation, the uh, um, uh, the huge differences between different areas of the country, some areas really seeing deep pockets of growth and development and other areas not seeing them. Yeah. So I, I think that's, you know, that's in a sense a kind of reflection I come after many years of doing that of that time mm. and trying to understand that through that sort of lens. Uh, um, now, there's what kind of factories were these? Were these the uh, manufacturing? Garment, um, primarily in the industrial parts, especially in, in, in Hawassa, but also in uh, in Buchen, which is one of the areas in the East Industrial Zone, which you, know, you were talking about around the Addis Ababa plan. And, and just a final point also, I think, the, you know, one of the major challenges that Ethiopia has faced for a long time, and certainly that affected the performance, of, it was, was the... Um, balance of payment constraints. You know, that's always been uh, a hit in the, the economy, the government always trying to catch up with the, with these challenges, never really uh, managing to to fulfill those those promises. And that really was was a major um a major drag. And and just the final point is ideas matter. Um and I think for those of us who are interested in industrial policy in other areas of Africa, I think if there, if there was one thing that really um characterized the 2012 to 2018 period was the incredible degree of coherence in trying to establish some form of plan that built the basic conditions for industrialization. You know, whether it was, and it wasn't just about attracting foreign direct investment, it was also about the electricity, you know, the, 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 which is a basic aspect of, you know, attracting industrial investment, education, so the base, the massive improvement in, in levels of basic education in the previous 10, 15 years, and the other elements of infrastructure. It's really hard to find any other country in the conditions that Ethiopia was facing in the 2000s that were able to achieve mm -hmm. those three things in 20 years. Mm. Yeah. If it's if it's directly related, yeah. Yeah, I was just going to say though this ideas matter point. I always think this is something that the you know you guys are effective states inclusive developments that you were always going on about this ideas matter. It's very interesting to hear this being thrown to you as a you know as a challenge. You know where are your ideas matter? Yeah, you will. <laughs> really agree with Carlos's point about the foreign exchange constraint because that actually led the government, I think, to to um, to interfere with certain interest groups, which was part of the conflict, I think. But but I wanted to ask you whether there's sort of two more dimensions to to this. One is uh, the the discussion, the presentation sort of emphasizes the disenfranchised youth, etc. But how much of the conflict, the protest, was actually elite driven, was top down? You just briefly mentioned it. it in our research, we came across that in Oromia quite a lot um, before it all, you know, erupt from 2010 yeah. onwards to 2016 or so. And the other dimension, I was just thinking about a little piece of field work I was doing in the Upper Awash Valley was to what, and Carlos, this is partly a question for you as well in Hawassa and so on, is to what extent was the agenda dimension to the violence, given so many of the jobs in those mm -hmm. parks, mm -hmm. in the large farms in the Upper Awash Valley, etc., in the farms near Deborah's Aid, etc., were women's, mm -hmm. and they were relatively easy to attack. So, I, I and of know, course, I the parallel the story. textiles, yeah. Well, have you got enough questions there for you? Oh, are there Probably. more? Did you get? Did, okay, should we should we take this one more? Yeah. Tom, I had a question. Okay, in that case, if there's two or three more, we'll do this round and then we'll do a, I think a final round after that. Yeah. yeah. There's a couple more. There's, there's the 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 chap there and and the guy at the front there. Yeah, I mean, so it's a short presentation. It's a 330 page book. <laughs> um, I don't disagree with anything you've said. I think, yeah, the time is important. Undoubtedly, it was, I think there's a lot of reasons why 2018 and not 1990, not the 1990s. I think ethnicity was very different in 2018 to what it was in the 1990s. Federalism undoubtedly did have an impact of politicizing ethnicity in a way and, and making ethnic, ethnic identity important in a way that it wasn't in the 1990s or on, on going back to the 1980s. And yeah, as the central means by which you engage with the state. 
education is undoubtedly hugely important in that you know it, you know it's not just a generation which don't have uh, opportunities but it's also a generation which is the best educated generation that there's ever been which has translated into rising expectations both for them and their families that you know we've invested in this in, in your education all these years there's nothing to show for it or very little to show for it um, and that sort of contributes to frustration and like you know people like um, Marco D'Annunzio and Daniel Mines have done really good sort of ethnographic studies of looking at the frustration that comes along with that, that you know, of, of rising aspirations, but yeah, the opportunities are missing. And I think, you know, in that sense, you know, the, the progress and essential, I mean, that's the argument is that, you know, inequality and people being bypassed by developmental successes is key to this whole story so yes there's undoubtedly i tried to mention it but like perhaps didn't emphasize it enough but class politics is a central part of that um alongside generational divisions and yeah rest assured your work is cited extensively in, in that <laughs> chapter um in relation to the industrial parks and labor and so on i mean yeah again ideas i mean ideas are present in that again you have to, you have to sort of choose pick and choose what you're going to emphasize i mean i think I think the uh, the argument I try to make in the book is that ideas, uh, ideas are hugely important. Ideas alone are not sufficient. In that, you know, you, if you have a political context which is not supportive of a regime pursuing structural transformation, having the idea in itself is not going to do and do, do not going to deliver. You need some of the structural factors in place. Um, in terms of state capacities, relationships with between the state and different sections of the population. Within that context, I think undoubtedly Mellers' Mellers's ideas and and other people's ideas around how you develop industrial strategy, development strategy, and so on were hugely important and hugely influential. But yeah, I think it comes back to that question that you know, yeah, if Mellers had been dropped in a different different country, he might have may have had the right ideas, but he wouldn't have been able to do anything. Yeah. And so I think it's you know trying to understand where the context of where ideas can become influential and can 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 really resonate is hugely important. You sort of wonder then are they the right ideas if the if the context is not right. But anyway, mm. Mm. how can they be the right ideas if you are in in charge of everything and your ideas are not anyway? I have other questions to answer. You have lots of them. Um, I'm working my way through slowly. I mean, the GERD, yeah, the danger of putting this slide up is they end up talking about another book which I haven't presented about. Yeah. Is the GERD, what's the GERD going to do? If the GERD will undoubtedly massively enhance electricity generation capacity, to a much lesser degree, it will inc increase energy generation capacity, which is an important distinction, which is one of the basic problems with the GERD in that it is capable of producing vast amounts of electricity at, for a short period of time. There isn't enough water to be able to run the GERD at, high, at full capacity all the time. Mm -hmm. So it will be important, but it's not going to have anywhere near the effect that it's been portrayed as having. The other aspect to it is just the electricity grid that, you know, the narrative has been this is going to solve Ethiopia's problems. Everyone's, you know, they're going around Afar, from field work that we did telling people they're going to instantly have electricity and this is you know this is they're going to be connected the reality is that they're not and that the expansion of the grid is a much well a task which is equally as big as building the grid it's originally so and yeah is much less advanced so it will have some positive impacts um but in terms of mass yeah sub universal electrification it's not going to achieve it anytime soon um and yeah, exports is a big challenge. I mean, there will be some. They've started exports, I think, to Kenya now, finally. Um, the challenge is that most countries within East African power pool share Ethiopia's ambitions of exporting electricity, and they're all investing in electricity generation. So there's going to be challenges about who's buying whose electricity and whether there is a market for it there. The big prize would be exporting to Egypt and Sudan, and that is tied up within lengthy negotiations, obviously, about the, the dam and its operation. So it's, yeah, politically fraught and some way off yet. So it will have positive impacts, undoubtedly, but it's probably not quite as much as the narrative suggests. The second question, I thought. Yeah, so Thomas, 
Um, Did you have a second question? Um, yes, yeah, so it was just about the transition into. Um, I guess it's similar. Uh, yeah, related, related, I think, yeah. in terms of fu the future. I mean, I think, will the developmental state be rehabilitated under another regime, which I think was part of your question? I think, so the reforms that have been talked about and not yet really implemented, I think, would unpick the developmental state entirely. So the you know, the World Bank's come in as you know replaced requirements in terms of liberalising the financial sector, liberalising the electricity sector, doing all of these different things. If it, if they actually implemented that and they've made some promises and it's kind of stalled around the conflict, then it would be a it, it would have to be a very different development strategy, completely different. And I think for the financial sector, if they go down that route, would be the key that you know once you've liberalised your financial sector, you're probably never going to get it back. And the financial sector was such a key tool for all of this investment that underpinned this process. So there is a bit of a critical juncture about what they do in the next coming years. It's not really clear. Abby's pretty opaque as to what his priorities really are. He talks about the private sector periodically. He's made lots of promises. He's done actually relatively little in terms of liberalization, um, bits and pieces around the edges. So it, yeah, it remains to be seen quite what route they go go down in the future, I think. Um, yeah, I mean, I think the key ethnicity is an important question that, you know, the country is currently extremely fragmented following um, the conflict. I mean, yeah, I wouldn't necessarily advocate a Kagami. I'm not sure that's necessarily the way to go. But like, how do you how do you put that together back together? I and mean, like, can you create a, an, Eth an Ethiopian political system that is truly federal and truly, but yeah, combined with peace and stability or do you need to go back for a centralization and find some way of yeah putting it all back together i yeah i don't know it's a it's a very difficult question to ask it's not obvious what the solution would be um and yeah ethiopia tends to make me look a bit of a fool when i make predictions so i'm not going to <laughs> um we have a couple more questions i think would you like yeah. to yeah uh, good evening, everybody. My name is Bill. My students are uh, doing my master's here at SOAS in Development Studies. Just two quick questions. One, what, how much would you, any thoughts on the regional challenges when it comes to Ethiopia's failed takeoff? I think, as I picture it, it's probably only Kenya and Djibouti around the region that have been stable throughout that whole period. And I always wonder why in Africa we never see the flying geese model of countries undergoing structural transformation and having spillover effects on their neighbors, like some synergy between Kenya and uh, Ethiopia. And my second question is, just out of curiosity, these industrial parks, were they good unionizable jobs or they were just basically sweatshops that Ethiopia was trying to grab onto just any form of the rung of the ladder of global value chain and then maybe work themselves up from there? Yeah. Great question. And there's somebody there at the front there, just in front of you. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, hi, so, uh, my name's Salma Al Samurai. I'm actually Naomi's husband. And also, uh, I'm at the World Bank and just moved to, to Ethiopia. So this has been really fascinating. Um, I just wanted to go back a little bit on the history of, uh, of the development model that you were discussing. And I mean, you, I think you presented kind of a mixed picture a little bit that there's been some fundamental, you know, fundamental and massive successes. I mean, the poverty rates that uh, uh, one of the audience picked up on it uh, is truly kind of remarkable. Um, but I just and so there were some, and then there were some, you know, di disasters in terms of the policies that were were taken up. But I just, I just wondered if, I mean, what your view is in the sense of, is it that the the whole sort of the 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 policies that were adopted and taken up uh were just the wrong policies and it was the wrong kind of model of state-led development that you're talking about or was it that the that the emphasis in some parts was wrong or in that it was just the way that it, the emphasis was wrong or the capacity of the state to be able to implement in the areas that it uh, it had chosen as as being, you know, these particular areas were were the wrong ones. Uh, and I mean, I guess what I'm trying to ask is, are you, 
saying that, that the whole idea of this kind of state-led development model that Ethiopia pursued it, it, it just not won't achieve the goals that it laid out for itself, or was it merely the the implementation of that policy that was that wasn't as good as it potentially could have been? Mm. Yeah. Okay. Um, the regional challenges. I mean, yeah, I think um, I seem to recall Mellers himself saying that they're in a rough neighbourhood or something, and that, that <laughs> certainly doesn't help. And I think that's undi undeniably true. I mean, yeah, to have flying geese, I guess you need an initial goose. Um, and yeah, I think his, well, his aspiration was that they would be the first and everything would follow from them and Ethiopia would sort of dominate the whole region. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it is not helped by the instability. And I think what's happened in, I think partly, partly fortuitously, partly through astute foreign policy, they were able for a period to manage the regional tensions quite well um, and stay, avoid getting drawn into conflicts in, with neighboring countries or, yeah, or in the case of some Somalia, insert themselves, but it wasn't terribly detrimental um, to, to what was going on internally. And I think what's happened since has been that, yeah, partly as a result of being drawn into yeah debt crisis and being drawn into into the sort of the orbit of the UAE and Saudi Arabia, and partly through yeah picking yeah some poor foreign policy choices and picking fights with people they didn't need to pick fights with, they've got stuck into that uh, pre what was previously the pattern of you know back and forth conflicts with many of their neighbours and getting drawn into that, which I think has been extremely unhelpful. Um, in the industrial parks, I mean, talk to Carlos about it. He's done more research on it than I have. I mean, I would say that basically the initial strategy was based on an explicit idea that one of the key things EPA, Ethiopia had was really cheap labor. And so that was what was sold to foreign investors, come and invest like our labor costs. We can we can give you yeah, nice, nice, shiny industrial parks, cheap rents and, and cheap labor. And you bring it, bring you bring in your investment. I think, yeah, Carlos's research essentially showed that that became problematic. That you know, people didn't want, you know, people who came into the parks didn't want to stay in the jobs because it was the, you know, it became huge amounts of turnover because they were made promises around the industrial parks that then weren't delivered. You then had a whole series of sort of, well, both turnover of labour, also wildcat strikes and various different things. And there's been an attempt to some degree to rethink that model and you know to some degree raise 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 labor standards but i think that's well from my understanding it's very much work in progress actually john there was a related question about gender mm. in this that actually i think is relevant at this point yeah i mean i i i personally don't think the industrial parks should be have too much of a causal so in terms of yeah the employment so there is a gender dimension, which is probably underexplored in the book, but, you know, undoubtedly in terms of unemployment rates, women fare much worse than men do. Um, also in terms of rural land access, women fare much worse than men do. Yet, as you say, in terms of floriculture, um, industrial parks and so on, there's this narrative about nimble fingers, but also probably compliant labor where women have been massively favored in terms of these industrial employments. In terms of absolute numbers, though that form of employment still is relatively small compared to the sort of size of the population, the size of the size of the numbers of people that we're talking about. So how I don't know. I I have no idea, but I, I'm doubtful about how much you know women being given jobs in 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 these enterprises would be a sort of a major flashpoint, but perhaps I'm I'm missing something. Um but yeah, there is undoubtedly a gendered element to employment and and, and these grievances um in terms of yeah are these the wrong policies are about lack of capacity um i mean i think going back to what i said earlier the progress that's happened is undeniable so whether they're the wrong policies no i mean i think some things undoubtedly failed some things were successful some things that failed they they changed their approach and tried something else and it worked a bit better so I don't, yeah, in terms of sweeping out the whole thing and saying, no, this is the wrong policy, I think is not the way, the answer. Again, capacity, 
I mean, well, so yeah, things like the sugar industry that was clearly poorly thought out, and that you know, in those senses, there are certain certain sectors where there are certain sectors where they whether I think they probably got it more or less right, or at least came to something that was a policy eventually which was more or less right. In other things like the sugar sector, it was just poorly thought out from the beginning. It was politically driven. It was this sort of yeah vast sort of amb overly ambitious projects which never really stood much of a chance. Alongside that, a complete mismatch between ambitions and capacity to deliver. So in the sugar sugar factories, a lot of it was contracted out to Metec, this military engineering company, which, you know, there's been all kinds of allegations around corruption since then, including in relation to the GERD. I'm, it's unclear to me quite how much of the problem was corruption, but what undoubtedly they were incompetent and were not able to have, have didn't have anything like the capacity that was required to deliver on this vast range of projects that they were that they were allocated and expected to build sugar factories all over the country to you know highly technical aspects of the dam and so on, and they just weren't up to it. That said, I mean I think the argument in the book is that at least part of this story beyond, I mean, Korea, Taiwan, they all made mistakes. China makes mistakes in terms of policies. Yeah. They, you know, industri you know, there's a big literature about how industrial policy is all about learning, that you you try something, doesn't work, you tweak it, you try something else, eventually you get towards something that works. I think there, and, you know, there was things like the focus on domestic capital, I think probably was a bit poorly thought out, that it probably didn't really fit with the way that the global economy currently functions. But at the same time, if they had gone down a foreign and industrial part foreign investment route in the late 1990s, early 2000s, would that have come off at a time when Chi I mean, the, basically they're capitalizing now or trying to capitalize on rising labor costs in China and sort of some export of industry. So I think there are constraints from the global economy, structural constraints, which makes it very difficult to have been able to do anything. Like if they tried something, tried what the industrial park strategy, which they later hit upon, which delivered some successes. I mean, I remember talking to Nawai Gavrab, the prime minister, one of the prime key prime ministers advisor. He was sort of saying, oh, my, my one regret would have been maybe we should have tried some of these things earlier. And I, my suspicion is that even if they had tried any things earlier, the, you know, the global economy wouldn't have enabled Ethiopia to launch into that at that point. So I think there are some structural problems, which means that regardless of the policy mistakes and the capacity limitations, it, yeah, I'm not convinced that it would have been feasible to... Global structural problems. Yes. Okay. Gosh, that's a bit... <laughs> Right. Do we have any other burning questions here? I wonder if you want to pick up again over this question of ideas, because I, I'm quite curious about it. You did just say right now about the uh, the idea of the the uh, very cheap labor being, mm. um, you know, one of the, you know, the biggest assets, I guess, um, if you like, that Ethiopia had. And I, I just remembered meeting a a Bangladeshi garments factory owner who had invested several tens of millions of dollars in a factory in in Ethiopia. Right. Yeah, that's the guy. But uh, you know, my heart is not beating for him because he was also the same guy who said when we were talking about the idea of a living wage for Bangladeshi garments workers, he scoffed at the idea that garments workers should be entitled to a living wage. So it strikes me that this is one of those old ideas that we have lots of cheap labor, so we should just go for the very bottom end of the, mm. of the market. It's not necessarily one of the best ideas. Um, and it turns out that in Ethiopia it really was not one of the best ideas. So, Yeah, I mean, I they got some initial investment investors there. How much of it was to do with initial promises of cheap labor? I'm not really sure. I think it quickly became apparent that focusing only on cheap labor was not a viable strategy long term. And I think to some degree, there's a recognition of that. Um, but yeah, what they're, I mean, I get what well, the challenge is that the, the, the sections of value chains and the value chains they're moving, they've been trying to move into, there isn't, a, you know, there's mar cost margins are minuscule in mm -hmm. terms of apparel. Yeah. So how much 
leeway you have to raise wages i mean that's the challenge is that you need to move out of you might it might be a stepping stone it's unclear whether it's a stepping stone to anything else but like you quickly need to move out into into higher value activities in order to in order to raise rise raise living standards um vietnam did though yeah I think cambodia I'm, has I think done the problem we have in the case of ethiopia is 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 the time frame yeah yeah and it's very difficult to judge when, you know, many of these companies, for example, if you take Hawasa, which was a flagship example, they really started in 2017, yeah. the operation started. And it is only after 10 years, 15 years, that you can judge to what extent that sector really is expanding and developing. What these companies usually do when they, when they arrive is, you know, I mean, cheap labor is meaningless. What matters is the unit labor cost. Mm -hmm. And for all of them, I think at the start in 2017, what they were all saying is that the initial efficiency levels were at 15, 20% of the benchmark, with Vietnam at that time being 85, 90%, and some of the top factors in China, 100%. Yeah. So there were actually, labor wasn't cheap in Ethiopia in 2017. They were not competitive, mm. not even compared to Bangladesh. But they, they knew because they had gone through many of these companies had invested in Cambodia and in, in, in Latin, and many countries where actually had some similarities with Ethiopia. They were not particularly worried, even on the labor turnover issue, not particularly uh, bothered because of, they always say, this is a, in a matter of three, five years, as long as the environment is stable, these things, these, these problems will disappear. Mm -hmm. you know, we're confident. Of course, you know, you're right that profit margins, uh, the, the sourcing squeeze, all these are structural elements of the global garment uh, uh, industry. Um, but it doesn't mean that they cannot succeed, even in a country like, like Ethiopia. The problem is that, you know, the, the crisis and the sort of that happened precisely mm. when they were starting to, you know, move up and wages have been rising, by the way, you know, more than, you know, 40 something percent in a matter of three three years in the middle of this crisis. So it's not like wages have, have to stay stagnant. This is the latest that we've got from the industrial parks. So it's it's just a shame that all these exploded within four years of many of these operations starting. Mm -hmm. and, and on the sweatshop thing, I have to say that, that if there was one thing that the government was very keen on was precisely to avoid the accusation of sweatshop. And this is why they committed to build those industrial parks in the way they were built. Very different from the no world. runner plazas. Yeah, exactly. no runner plazas. Mm. Absolutely no, yeah. intolerable. Yeah. But um, you mean even we increase the wages of our employees, but still industry stays there. That there, there must be some advantage, right? Of course, and and the fact that uh, I mean, it, it, there was there has been one shocking thing for me. I have to say, is how resilient many of these investors have been. I mean, the fact that some of these investors haven't packed and gone like two, three years ago is, mm. is, is a mystery. But actually, the one thing that really made the difference was Agoa, the yeah. suspension of Agoa. Agoa was, you know, a, one of the reasons why some of these exporting firms uh, set foot in these industrial parks, mm. because they had access to the U.S. market, quarter free, anti oh, of course. The, the war caused the suspension of Agoa, basically, because of the response of the U.S. government. Mm. And the suspension is still there. Okay. And even the workers themselves are so aware of this. Mm. That their bargaining power now has been so affected by the goal because that is the narrative of management in most of these factories. Yeah, okay. There's no way we can increase your wages. It's really cool. A goal is the Africa Growth Opportunity Act, which allows African countries to export quota-free and tariff-free manufactured goods to the U.S. market. So it means that many Asian firms, it's not just Chinese, in Bangladesh, in Sri Lanka, come there and they get an advantage. Given the profit margins, how squeezed they are, this kind of incentive actually matters. Okay, so it makes sense for them to, to, to mm -hmm. invest in a country like Ethiopia. Plus the added advantage of uh, made in Africa branding, which a lot of global buyers wanted. Okay, so they had this advantage. Now, with the suspension and the crisis in the U.S. market, all that disappears. Mm -hmm. And that really is the trigger for many of these firms now living, rather than the war or, you know, even the COVID pandemic was almost negligible impact.
But you don't think if there are two problems of enclave economy and uh, human capital increase, then they stay as a production base? No, they can stay as a production base. They can stay in some way or something. Yes, I can. How many countries have started with the Czech Southern Guard? Pretty much every industrialized country started from there. That's right. So I think we've moved to the stage of the evening where we're we're heading towards the bar, I think, at this stage, to have a conversation over there. So I'm going to, if there's no further burning questions for Tom, I think that's what we'll do is we'll head in the first, was that was that a question? Yes, there is one burning question. Would okay. you like the, would you like the microphone? There's, I think Elisa has the microphone there. Uh, Mike Greensboro and I, um, do like water history amongst other technology study stuff. So I'll be excited about your other book. Um, uh, just, I wonder in terms of the ideas, what about the ideas in terms of social movements that obviously there's a huge social movement activity if you end up with war, but there's also social movements that were possibly opposed to war. What um, social movements can either be engaged with having a strategy for development or they can be just resentful in trying to stop the government doing things. What was, where, where does the ideas of people in potentially conflict with the government come into uh, a development theory? Because it, it seems this is a very much, what did the elite do? And can you justify that? Or that you shouldn't deal with that? Is our is social movements that are deal with authoritarian governments irrelevant to the economic development or are social movements more relevant in less authoritarian or more so how where would you put those that pe people's ideas that fit the not just the ideas of elites but the ideas of the non-elites the people who are organizing in factories the people who are trying to get new land or develop a movement and say to their neighbors how can the government help us okay sure um i mean i think context is important in that so going back to the 1990s initial, you know, I think a lot is depends on where Ethiopia was at that point and where it come from. That post-revolution, essentially, yeah, you know, yeah, capitalist class had been wiped out. There was, you know, rural agriculture was relatively flat in terms of class structure. There wasn't sort of and and post civil war yeah they you know they the government fought to power their way to power militarily they they didn't face major opposition from society essentially one way or another you know, when they took power they operated relatively freely mm -hmm. at that point in time um social and and actively you know as you know the argument here is that they actively sought to control and suppress independent movements outside the party structure <laughs> So I think there was this, you know, from their view, it was sort of the revolutionary democratic idea of, you know, that they are the vanguard and they're sort of mobilizing the population. The flip side to that is obviously that they were, yeah, controlling and limiting discussion outside of party structures in, a, in any meaningful way. As time went on, as well, the economy developed, as divisions became more apparent, both ethnic, generational, class, I think you do get to see moments where social movements were able to express themselves in particular ways. So 2005 was a big one in terms of opposition around the uh, around, um, opposition around that election. Split between, on the one hand, a sort of a very na Ethiopian nationalist countering this sort of ethnic federal federal line, another part which is more ethno nationalists countering whether the government had really implemented this sort of ethnic autonomy that it claimed to be um, pursuing. Um, and more recently, yeah, and it's been within the context of a federal system which politicizes ethnicity within the context of, yeah, regional elites who are actively seeking to mobilize people and, and manipulate people. That's is, and the narrative has very much been around in terms of anti-government protests as being an ethno-nationalist predominantly, and the idea that this was a regime which was purely Tigrayan dominated, favoring Tigray. Now, I think there are, depending where you look, you can find some support for that in places, but as an overarching narrative that this was just a regime which was favoring Tigray, I think I'm, I have yet to see anything that is really 
um, clear on that. Um, but yeah, it's become, as most things in Ethiopian politics, it's become purely or predominantly ethno-nationalist in terms of the framing for those. And I think one of the interesting things is, you know, these divisions were deep-rooted, they're widespread. I think it could have been in another universe, you could have had a, had a social movements which were organized along generational or class lines. The reality was that they were only ever organized on ethnic lines. So at periods you had sort of um, both Amhara and Oromo movements periodically they would collaborate they would sort of express support for one another when the when the when the militaries were suppressing or the federal police were suppressing one of the other social movements but there was never any hint that you would have an ethiopian social movement which was um to to resist the government it was always an ethnically organized one and i think yeah i think that's the one of the key problems that now exist is how do you work with a, uh, yeah, a context in which politics is cleaved along ethnic lines and it's yeah it's far from clear how you go beyond that and or even work with it because it becomes about mm. ethnic elites competing for national power and mobilizing yeah their yeah their ethnic groups in pursuit of that good well i think we're going to leave it there now because we've exhausted tom and asked him lots of very very long and difficult questions <laughs> thank you so much tom thank you Pleasure. we appreciate it but before i let you all go though we have several more really quite fascinating uh, seminars in this series coming up the next one there's actually three in march don't ask me i didn't i didn't decide on these dates but uh, the next one is the launch of a book and there will be a reception afterwards and actually that's not the right room ingrid do you know the right room is it? It's in the Brunei Gallery. So please come to that. That will be really interesting if you're interested in these issues of conflict and humanitarian um, uh, disarmament. And uh, Mary Calder will be speaking at that as well. So that will be very interesting. And we have, as you see on the right side, a bunch more really fascinating speakers. Uh, thank you so much, Tom. That was really excellent. I think we're probably going to head to the bar for a quick one now, if anyone would like to join us and continue the conversation. So thank you so much for coming. Thank you.